el tema central de todo este día es los ejercicios y otras cosmologías y espiritualidades. Hoy, hoy se nos invita a tomar conciencia de que el trasfondo cultural... Today we're going to be thinking about the other cosmovisions and spiritualities in other places of the planet and how that demands adaptation in which, in the way in which the spiritual exercises are given, we have to be open to the spirit that will guide us in our attempts to discern these possibilities and the limits as well of these confluences and adaptations. Today's keynote presentation is spiritual exercises facing the cosmovisions and spiritualities. Javier Meloni is going to be giving us this presentation. Javier is a Jesuit. He's currently the director of the Spirituality Center, the Cova San Ignasi in Manresa, Spain. He's been living here for 25 years. He's a PhD in theology, has a degree in cultural anthropology. He's a member of Christianity and Justice, Cristianismo y Justicia. He specializes in Ignatian spirituality, interreligious dialogue, and compared mystic, mystics. He's the author of a number of publications in each one of these fields and a great friend. I give the floor to Javier Meloni. Thank you. Thank you for the sobriety of your presentation. Let's see. Mystagogy is the term that in fact calls for the symposium to express that St. Ignatius spiritual exercises are part of the initiatic paths or mystical initiations that are present in all spiritual traditions of humanity. So the word comes from mista, meaning belonging to the mysteries, and agia, what leads. Life is pure mystery, pure mystery. Every existence is uh, an abyss of the infinite going beyond us in the same way as we contain. To be exceeded by what we encompass is the paradox of human condition. Our nature stands between what is divine and cosmic, and it is a triad that's present in all traditions on Earth. I identify the key and the nucleus of Ignatian mystagogy as the process that uh, is uh, revealed and unveiled simultaneously in the mystery of God of each one and the mystery of the world in a process of unification by means of identification and dedication of the retreatant to the mission vocation in that act. And all this through the contemplation and the interiorization of Jesus Christ model of this divine humanity. So in this sense, the spiritual exercises are not only a mystagogy, but rather a Christagogy, using uh, a term coined by Father Joseph Maria Rambla in a beautiful text that was written some years ago. The question we pose is to what extent this process of the giving of the I to the you of God and the all of what is real can take place through different references that are biblical and evangelical and through a relationship that is different to that based on a personal link with Jesus Christ. The issue here is to clarify to what extent, despite the cosmovisional, theological and anthropological difference, we can in fact reach the result that the exercises propose, which is common to all mystical initiations and all initiatic ways and pathways in humanity, that is to go from the egoic self-reference to which we are all captive to reach the union with the origin and the source of reality. And this becomes another gift to all other beings, not only humans, but also the other creatures of the earth. I'm going to be focusing on two poles. It's impossible to, to do more, talk about all the traditions and cosmovisions, but I do think that there are two polarities that are the basis of the presentations coming, the presentations coming after me. We have those related to Earth, the theocosmical um, discourses in which the presence is done through what is cosmic, and then Eastern or Oceanic 
traditions and religions in which the basic relationship is not you and I, but rather this uh, ocean dimension. It's a dis dissolution of the I in what is cosmic, Buddhism, Taoism, and many of these uh, of the Hindu schools of thought. These two poles correspond to something that's very significant. On the one hand, they're cosmical or Aboriginal religions because of the importance that they have nowadays for us to reconnect with nature, a link that these have not lost. These are Aboriginal traditionals. Ab origin means to be precisely in the origin, and the origin is precisely there on the earth, on the soil. So these Aboriginal traditions have not lost the link that today is necessary for survival of humans on planet earth on the one hand, and on the other, the contribution of Eastern religions is because they help us uh, go along three different avenues or ways. The internization of the Western subject, moving over to a self-awareness that is beyond the, the individual, beyond the I, so an awareness of ourselves without the I, uh, compared to the danger of narcissism or absolutism that we have done in, in, in the West about the subject. Second displacement away is the passing of the mind to the body, meaning of faith, um, Catholicism, all this has a lot to do with doctrine, um, a lot of mind, right, in the way we come close to faith. And then uh, here there is an immediate move, yes, as well. When one starts with Eastern meditation, the first thing that one does is sit and breathe, and anything else will come later. So the direct, it is this um, displacement moving from thinking to perceiving uh, corporality. So it's a very immediate and differentiating experience. And yet another displacement away is that from word to silence. This is also very, very significant and we shall see more later on. And other than these theocosmical and Aboriginal and Eastern um, cosmovisions, I'm going to be mentioning Sufism as well in an attempt of coming closer to Islam, we do have a, quite a difficulty in understanding Islam from theological categories and even more from the ideological point of view. We'll see how spiritually there is um, quite an inspiring coming close to Islam if we do it along this avenue. Any spiritual way or initiatic practice has two poles, two sides, two extremes. I'll come as close as I can because time is limited, isn't it, in these very extensive um, issues in two areas. One, the parkour, the journey, mystagogy has that and it's the key of the exercises as well, four weeks. And we have a very specific way to go. How can we become free in the way, of course, to adapt it, to make it longer or shorter, but there is a journey to be made. And all mystagogies refer to a journey and to specific means for that to be done. There's a way to pray, texts that you use to pray, specific practices during that uh, practice. Yes, so there's a way to go, a journey, and the elements that make it possible. I'll try and talk about both things. Obviously, the text will be written, I will upload it, and I'll do what I can in my presentation. So what about this journey? Yes, the itinerary. Iliade, in a very important um, text, which is uh, Mystical Initiations, it really is a um, um, mystical um, study that's really very good. And very good, sorry. And there's a summary in four steps of all initiatic ways and journeys of humanity, in which obviously we include the spiritual exercises. First of all, there is a moving away, a retreat, the fact of moving away from ordinary time. There is this separation of profane, ordinary time of the dissolution of everyday life to a holy time. Yes, the exercises have a specific time and one looks to uh, do them in a specific place, but the time that rules is a time away from the everyday human time. Second, descending to hell or to the shadows. Of course, that's more personal and hell is, is more collective, but there is going down to darkness, to hell, to one owns uh, shadows. Then third, there's a rediscovery, a discovery of a new name, a new identity that is 
is received and sometimes this comes with a new name that is given and the fourth step of this mystagogic journey there is a going back to the world with a new vision and a new identity which is of course our aim yes and we obviously on the basis of these four elements we're going to be analyzing this uh, mystagogical journey and we'll see how they relate to each other and, and how they differ from other mystagogies as well. This moving away, the retreat. The spiritual exercises open up specific time and space. Time and space become denser and one has to go barefoot in this holy climate. Initially, the spiritual exercises were thought for 30 days, and this is not banal. Anything else is an adaptation of the 30 days, because 30 days is the minimum time for important transformations, significant transformations to take place, because what, of course, defines any initiatic ritual or oh, is the fact of its being non-reversible once you have lived it you never go back to being what you were you change irretrievably and we have to define then this time yes i mean people we, we know about the difficulties of ignatius with melchior cano and others that would criticize the exercises because they thought that 30 days were not sufficient for the changes that one supposedly has to operate in oneself and there's the the critique of a number of more traditional schools yes they consider that 30 days how can you change someone in 30 days is their stance so this is important it's 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 important anyway and then the presumption is that there is a space for that to happen too we've seen that there are situations that don't allow for this there are different adaptations to everyday life but whatever happens uh, those people doing exercises in daily life, they will make a, a special place at home. They will place an image. It's the making of a holy space and also of a holy time devoted to in everyday life. So yes, time and space are adapted for something significant to happen. I don't know what inmates do, but maybe they select some, some tree in the courtyard of prison or there's some image in any corner, maybe under the pillow, it might be a holy place for them that it's important because something different happens there from what happens elsewhere. As to the extension of the times, yeah, there's such a diversity in initiatic traditions of other schools. For example, you have three years silence that some of the Buddhist uh, schools follow. There are months that are more or less regulated in Taoist Hermits, the citizen, weeks, and then there are um, other types of practices of shorter periods, for example, the 10 days of Vipassana, 10 very strict and clear and well-defined days. And we have the weeks and the months that uh, are possible in the jungle, in the mountains, following Aboriginal, African Aboriginal traditions, American Aboriginal traditions, uh, well, North American, Mesoamerican, South American. I'm sure we'll hear about this in greater detail. Yes, about how long, how much time. It depends on the ritual. And well, the North American Indians have an important moment, which is how to get to the great vision and those are days of fasting, days of not drinking any water, not eating, even not sleeping. And that might be a week in, 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 in bodily borderline situations so that special openings take place. Yes, and things happen that wouldn't happen in the normally comfortable circumstances we live. And this goes to a very important element for our homes, meaning all these special times of retreat have austerity as regards eating, drinking, and sleeping. And these, uh, the fasting and the vigils and all this, uh, you cannot separate from any initiation experience because it means establishing a different relationship with our bodies, with our habits, with our basic instincts. 
what happens to us when we don't eat? What happens to us when we don't drink? And what happens to us when mosquito bites us, or when we don't sleep well, or when we wake up in the middle of the night? We have actually left all this behind and we become somewhat sleepy, yes? And our spiritual exercise homes have become three-star hotels. And this is a drawback for the deep initiation experience. It really is a, a serious drawback. We should not forget, for example, that all this started in a, in a cave downstairs where we are. And look at us, we are over and above the cave. So what's the relationship between the cave and us? Well, only in this we have a question mark that we should be able to reflect on honestly and openly. But I'll just leave this for you to meditate. So we have this retreat, this separation that requires an interruption and moving away from the typical comfort of life. It means looking for extraordinary time that allows us to do away with our identifications and go to a place that we don't know, because if not, it won't be mystagogy. It will simply be a prolongation of what we know already, and then there will be no difference. So it means retreat away in time and space from what we know. So. In the exercises, there's the principle and the foundation so important. It's been said already because in this moving away, something happens. A new standpoint is open, a new horizon. If we are in the middle of a, a, a woods or in, in, on a street, we don't have that. But if you move away, it means going up to the hill, to the top of the hill, go somewhere where you can see where you come from and where you're going to. And it is that awareness of uh, where we come from and where we go to, where a mystagogy is proposed, a journey, a path. But before that, one has to be aware of, of one's origin and one's destination in the finality way. In principle and foundation, we are told that human beings save themselves, that is, they reach their plenitude or the, their realization to the extent to which they start a relationship revering isolation dedication serving our lord and this horizon of principle and foundation contains the essential movement of the universal religious instinct the human being is placed in an origin that doesn't depend on himself the human being is created there is an immensity before him or her and the end there's an immensity transcends he or she exists in a four so in the way of moving from the origin in which we are received and the finality to which we dedicate we have the deployment of all this mystagogy of all the path however when in principle and foundation we see these three verbs that is that we mm, revere and serve so when other religions and cosmovisions are known then one realizes it that these three verbs praise revere and serve god our lord belong to a specific image of god and behind these three verbs we have an underlying masculine sovereign divinity coming from a patriarchal hierarchical cosmovision coming from the sovereign monarchies of the middle east 3000 years ago times in which the biblical image of God was actually came to being and it was reinforced by Saint Ignatius because of a masculine uh, court, uh, late medieval and Renaissance type mentality. So, I mean, what's universal then in the deployment is not really universal in its formulation. And quoting James Hanvey in his presentation when he uh, quoted Charles Taylor. It's difficult to believe in that God nowadays. That representation of God um, is difficult to believe in right now. So, in the very first sentence, we have yes, okay, there's this deployment of the origin and the Precedence, but the way in which it is formulated is something specific and particular, and it has to be interpreted according to context, not in ours because we know it already, but in many other contexts, yes, it has to be interpreted. And then in Christianity, we have the monotheist sovereign figure of 
God, that that's the face of Jesus Christ. And this, on the one hand, makes that divine majesty come close to people, but at the same time, it's uh, anthropomorphical. I mean, it's a human face. And the access to the absolute is done through a human being who's 30 years old, who's a Jew, and who's a man. It's the Forma Christi, Forma Jesu, that uh, defines the exercises that are based on the biblical narrative and on uh, Jesus as the dictator of the path. Um, it is possible to have another type of relationship in which this journey is uh, parkoured in a different way along other paths that are not through this pattern. In most Eastern practices, the opening to the all takes place without the I-you relationship because the I and the you are relative. And however, there is an annihilation of the I and the you, which is not really an, a depersonalizing annihilation, but rather leads to compassion and wisdom. And in Aboriginal religions, the accent of God is not anthropomorphic, it's rather cosmoformic. It takes ways and shapes of animals, of mountains, of clouds, of tempests, of signs in the sky. And within them, the deactivation of the egocentric tendencies happens through the relationship with the natural forces, with all the power and beauty that they contain. It's in these manifestations in which the experience of what is holy happens and where the human being is discovered as uh, the one on watch of his environment, not as the Lord who disposes and decides. So we are in very different frameworks of that uh, principle and foundation definition that we find evident. But if you change the context, things change. You have to be aware of how you translate all that, maintaining the movement of the journey. But up to what point can we change the language? Because that's changing the dynamics, maybe? Or is it favoring dynamics? I leave all those issues there to think about. I won't, I don't have all that much time. Remember, you have the written text. I've made it available. But uh, going down to hell or to the shadows, this happens in the first week. It's the second step of initiation. We said first the retro, the moving away. Second, going the descending into hell or into the shadows. Any initiation starts by eliminating obstacles and hurdles along the way. And now a universal principle, only what emerges to awareness and conscience can be released and freed away from. So one has to dive into the depths of the of the unconscious and one has to go deep into hell, down into the shadows. The first week of the spiritual exercises wants to make the retreat into aware of what happens when one has this transgression. You go against universal order and that means personal disorder, sin, and the pain that this disorder entails in oneself, in the other human beings, and also in the other creatures, in the other beings of creation. The idea is to be fully aware of this descent towards the non-being, the imbalance happening in all beings when one moves away from the source, from the origin. All traditions, all cultures have uh, these original myths about their origins that in one way or another, as is the case of our biblical narrative, explain that uh, the world has an enormous potential and it's been created and defined for our use. And in some way or another, there's a breaking, a rupture, a cataclysm, a disorder, an interruption of that primeval order. Something happens to break all that. And all these narratives try to explain why, the reason why this disorder in the initial order, what is it that causes that disorder, that rupture. According to the Bible narrative, it's because of the appropriation. It's because what has been granted as a gift wants to be taken over as a possession. And of course, this is uh, the tree of life. For example, if one wants to take it as one's own, that means rupture. Everything disappears. Everything breaks. It explodes. And Eden as such will disappear. Eden, which is everywhere and nowhere, that exile that is nowhere and everywhere, depending on how we live our relationship with the other. 
So, maybe the essential difference between East and West, between biblical traditions, uh, Judeo-Christian and Eastern traditions is that in the Bible tradition, the consideration is that that movement to, to take over what has been gifted is conscious and responsible. So we are guilty. Okay, so this uh, guilt makes us responsible. Whereas in the East, they don't talk about being guilty, but rather ignorant. Avidya is the word. Avidya means not to see, not to understand. There is no vision, no understanding. And so the ways of uh, seeing the cause of disorder will be different. Yes, uh, we as Christians uh, see it on the basis of responsibilities. We are guilty, yes. So we are made to face our own life and the narrative of the origins to discover what our responsibility was about that disorder, that rupture. We could say it's shock therapy, really, because you are confronted with the original narrative, even with hell. Yes, the hell meditation as the consequence, the ulterior consequence, the ultimate consequence of living in the absolute of the I, of the ego. We create hell, we provoke, we cause hell. Instead, in Eastern traditions, as the mind cannot access its own ignorance, because the mind is ignorant of its own ignorance, so the mind cannot know about itself because there's no standpoint, no perspective. What does the mind do? Nothing. It's a silence. And in the silencing of breathing or of a mantra or whatever, there is this emergence right from the depths of the unconscious, of the shadow, the disorder that is part of our body in pain that will come up. It is written in images that appear from and in our memory. And it is this opening up, yes, of the here and now, right from our inner self comes the disorder of what in Buddhism is also considered the origin of all evil, which is affection, really. Affection is the same as grasping what has been given to you. And all this is cause of suffering because we attach to things and we don't know how to live without them. And as we can't live without them, well, then we take them, we grab them from others. And all this is this disorder of the Dharma as they define eternal, of the eternal order of things. And we alter all that. The first week of the spiritual exercises, well, that has results. The awareness of this disorder and the possibility of the restoration of what is still broken, which is forgiveness, the conscience of forgiveness. And the awareness and conscience of forgiveness mean that there is much more to go along than our own selves. Our false identifications kidnap us and they confine us to a corner of ourselves in this self blame. But in the exercises, in a Christian way, we are opened up to the embrace of the Father, but there are other ways to open up to the reconciliation with everything that is beyond what I've lived and beyond the proximity. One can go beyond oneself. So the reconnection with the source opens a horizon that can be gone along once the false identification with what one thought one was has been discovered, we have to move, we have to go through the awareness of the non-being to begin to be. The third moment of any initiation practice after having gone down the descent into hell, going down to the shadow, something that is terrifying, a part of ourselves that we deny and only by embracing it can we incorporate it, then the complete person can indeed receive a new name, the new name. This new name in the exercises is uh, the whole journey of the second week in which the choice is going to take place. And that choice is the listening to that uh, single and um, individual call in which God through Jesus calls us to follow him and love him and become that for which we came to life. That is the election, right? The choice uh, very beautifully expressed uh, by Herbert Alfonso. Yes, uh, I mean, this can be done 
in different ways, but a very beautiful one is this rendition. The second week, the confluence of this election, which is to listen to that call. We listen to a call because we ourselves are not able to recognize it within ourselves. He is calling us towards that which we are not yet being it but we cannot see it we are called from from outside because we cannot see it in ourselves and this is the opening of the second week of the exercises well in other traditions this exists as well in hinduism itself uh, which later on will uh, work on this dissolution of the eye but it's not just any dissolution the eye is diluted after being aware of who it is they talk about Shepka Dharma, for example, that is the art of complying with the duty of the call. It is that by which nature gives to each human being and that each human being can do spontaneously to live their Dharma to the world. Dharma universal order takes place through the small Dharma of each one of us, each small life in its place in the world and each life that does what? It has to be done and then there is all the course in the environment of each being and then this the microspace of each one has of course macrocosmic consequences so then if each one uh, moves to order then this will move towards cosmic order and if i i make order within myself and my environment i will be doing that for the macrocosm and in others we we hear about seal the secret of god each one is a secret of god that only one can recognize in the depths of one's heart. Each one of us has a unique relationship with God because we are all unique. And to the extent that we discover that relationship with God, we manifest an aspect of God. Each one is the revelation of a secret of God. This is just fascinating. It's so close to our personal vocation and it comes from the East. You know, it has a theological dimension. It's incredible. It's a theophany. Each one of us are a theophany of a name of God. And they have not only the 99 names of Ahala, but they each one is a secret name of God. And to the extent that we get to the diaphany of our being, our life is the revelation of that secret. In traditional initiations, well, one receives a new name the knowledge of one's own identity. And this is done through the interpretation of specific signs in the environment, be them terrestrial or heavenly. It might be mm, the birth constellations. We'll hear this next. Also the constellations of the moment in which we are, the emergence of animals, yes, eagles or snakes. While the retreat is happening, animals come up. They are not by chance, they are causal animals. They happen in that interconnection with everything. A series of signs appear. One has to know how to interpret them, not rationally, but rather in an analogical and participatory way. And also through the way in which one reacts to specific proof. Okay, when fasting or exposure to danger, one reacts with intelligence working on a trap somebody else will be strong using a tree it depends on the way one reacts when facing adversity one gets signs of one's identity and in that way we all discover our place in the world and the way in which we are in the world and in this way everyone receives a new name in the exercises there's all this discovery discernment of the personal call and what is the structural center of the exercises well first week you take out obstacles second week prepare for discernment and at least in the theoretical structure of the exercises it's at the end of the second week when the election the choice happens according to the different schools of thought it is said that the purgative way is the first week the enlightening way for the knowledge of our lord to better love and serve 
the more I know the, the Lord, the more I know myself and, and I will follow my call. And all that um, concludes the choice, the election, and that is the beginning of the unity way. Not explicitly explained, but it has been said that this choice is the Ignatian name of union, right? When we give ourselves to God in that that we feel, yes, uh, the, the, the giving in that call, that's the beginning of the unity way because uh, we do his will in such a way that we do his will and eventually we become his will. So it's not only of, of carrying out, but being his will. And we can only be it if we are in the very center of our being. And that is the call, vocation. Well, here begins another stage in the exercises. Here, there is a very, very important turning point, as important as the beginning of the exercises. When the choice is done, one enters another atmosphere of a unitive way. It's not made explicit, but yes, it is uh, understood implicitly because one is not going to pray with the crucified Christ. One is not going to identify. I mean, one comes close, but in that coming close, I mean, remember the first week we are before Christ, crucified Christ. In the second week, we've been with Jesus and that with Jesus goes up to the passion. But what does this mean? Divinity hides that's the hermeneutic key i mean james hanvey has said it constantly dan said it as well divinity hides but what what is hiding everything is hiding it's death but death what of of what one knew already of what one had preconceived of what one had expected one gets to Jerusalem with the joy of seeing the palms and with the, 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 the joy of election in one's hand. Here I am, Lord. Here you have me. I'm all yours. Okay. But now another cycle begins as important and as radical to descend to a deeper place, deeper than those first shadows, because those first shadows were dark. But the shadows in which we are going to go now are luminous, but they are once one has gone through them, not before. Let me make myself clear. This is very beautifully represented by the entry of Jesus in Jerusalem. Jesus comes closer and closer to the temple, supposedly where God is there in the Sancta Santorum, and the more he goes into the temple till he gets to the heart itself of what one could not approach, he is ejected, made to leave. So it means that we go into the place thinking it's Jerusalem that we have to go to, and we are made out of Jerusalem because what is holy is not within, but out. It's everywhere, isn't it? But when we have sequestered that, it cannot be within. So we get close to the God sequestered by ourselves. And God himself makes us out of that place where he cannot be sequestered. And that's why divinity hides. Our idea of divinity hides. Our idea of ourselves is hidden. And the idea, any kind of messianic idea, yes, is hidden. It hides. God is not manifesting himself. The close God ends up being a God that's far. It's a generous God becomes a sacrificing God. The extraordinary face of Jesus is deformed into a bleeding cadaver with death spasms. And the world goes to darkness because nobody can tolerate for such a catastrophe, for such wrecking sadness. And there is a point in which everything tumbles down and there is where everything recommences. And this makes the path a mystagogy because if it's a mystery of God, a mystery of ourselves, a mystery of God, it cannot be evident because if not, we would be in a catechism, wouldn't we? It would be catechism. It was, but exercises are not catechism. They are the initiatic experience involving the death, the descending to the first shadows so that as whole and we eventually die and we recover what we are including the shadows and the darkness within. 
Jose yesterday or before, it's a pity he's not here, but he'll hear this, so I'll say it anyway. Anyway, Jose um, made a, a beautiful exegesis in the autograph when the final mysteries are presented, yes, at the death of Jesus. It is said, it is written, Jesus without a shelter and Dalmasis, uh, well, people corrected, yes, the, Jesus that has no shelter, but we are told, no, 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 it's not desamparado, desamparado. There's an M that changes everything. And in what point of the way are we of this initiation path are we? Because in a key before dying, we can feel that Jesus is uh, with no shelter and the same we feel about death, unprotected abandoned, forsaken. But if we go across that very narrow way, well, then we see that this shelterless place is in fact the place of revelation. And Jesus reveals that place of hiding. And that is where God begins to reveal himself from himself. Jesus without veils, the veil of the temple is broken and where is it manifested where one would say it is more occult and that is where it is more manifest. It is the revelation of the cross, right? The revelation of the cross. Who is Christ? That's the question that's, of course, one, one cannot give this up. Why Christ? But not our images of Christ. It's not the same thing at all. Our images of Christ are not Christ. And our doctrine about Christ is not Christ either. Christ is the encounter of two emptyings, the encounter of what is divine in the human and the human in the divine. It's not only who is Christ, Jesus, but what is Christ? What is this total emptying because of love? And this emptying has a face, of course, the face of Jesus, of course. What makes us Christians is that 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 face, I mean, we activate as well the potential of our giving, of our dedication, but there are other ways to go along, maybe. Or without the maybe, there are other ways, but we don't know them. Well, in Zen, they talk about the great death, the great death of the I in the moment of passion. And in Sufism, they say, I am tormented by the I there is between you and I take it away. I don't want any I to be ever between us two. Anjalar, and this is 10th century. Between you and I, there is an I tormenting me. Please make this I am move away from myself. So what is left of ourselves without the eye? What is left of that drop when it falls in the pond? It loses its shape, but the unity of the drop is there still. We are, what are we, the substance of within the drop or the shape of the drop? We are both things, of course. And that is why we are individualized. But there is a false identification, which is the one of the breaking. Yes, like the veil of the temple is totally broken and ruptured. It's not only the image of God. What is breaking as well is the self-identification we have. That breaks as well, like the veil, the passion. And then comes resurrection. And I'll make headway as fast as I can. I'm not doing very well at all about time. Never mind. Christ resurrected is and is not the same as Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, he is the same, but he's not. It, he's not a regression back in time when Mary recognizes him and he says, don't, don't retain me. You have to come to me. Not. I to you. And that Christ is manifested as we were told so beautifully yesterday in Montserrat and at other moments of the day. He is manifested to us in different ways. The resurrected Jesus Christ is not 
evident in any one of the initial apparitions. And when he has been recognized, he disappears so that he doesn't remain fixed in one apparition because each one is followed by a disappearance. And I'm there amongst you, but don't reify me. I am much more than what you think I am, as you yourselves are much more than what you think you are. And the world is much more than what you think you see. That is the death, isn't it? In which everything has been hidden for everything to be manifested in another order. It's another ontological level. There's a rupture of the level, a quantitative transformation. So where do the spiritual exercises take us to, to the opening of the contemplation to reach love, where resurrected Christ also ascends in mystagogy in the gospel, because you can read that as a, as a catechesis, but the gospel itself is mystagogy. I mean, the texts are mystagogy. The ascending to heaven, yes, means to give lure, to open up to a specific way uh, or a specific manifestation of Christ in order to say, from then you will see me everywhere because I am giving you the same spirit that has made me be anointed Christ. So he is giving us the button, right? He is giving us what he was. And he says, because you are what I am. But that makes us terrified. It's much easier to revere fire than it is to become fire because fire burns. Fire demands everything. It consumes everything. What do we do at the end of the contemplation to get love? Take my Lord, receive my freedom, my memory, my intelligence, take it all. I only need you. And what am I when everything I am is the place of God in myself? It is me, but not the I I think I am. I am the manifestation of the only one in my only manifestation as well to serve the world. So the Christology of the exercises culminates in that that one that had been object of contemplation throughout the exercises has become so interior that eventually one ends up in locus Christi, in the place of Christ. The contemplation to reach love doesn't have Jesus or Christ as the object of contemplation, but rather it is the subject from which we contemplate the world. Uh, so Thomas, yes, to take and eat, take and drink. We have become Christ for the world. And if we have become one with him and he is everything, well, then we are everything too in him. Once again, we are terrified and justifiably so because he demands everything too. But then we think about the end without being at the end. And that's why our thoughts are very short. Our theology is, is, is short, it's narrow, because it talks about the end without being at the end. And our words are totally insufficient. And we believe too much in our words. And what mystagogy does is just release. Yes, it just explodes everything. It shatters all those words that are useless, useless. They go at the beginning, they give us some kind of guidance, but Truly, to go along the mystical way, and that is what the exercises are, you end up in a state of, of giving. And this um, state is also a state of full receptiveness in which God is present in all things, emerging from within, emerging from the shapes and forms of the world. And God is descending from the heavens as beauty, justice in the form. So the, he both ascends and descends. And to that essential original place is to the place that all mystical paths in humanity tend to. Let me read you an Upanishad, which is just exquisite, if I may. And it says, that which is different from what is known, and that is beyond what is unknown, that is what we listen of the old masters who told us. 
what cannot be expressed in words and however is the reason why words express that is in truth the absolute and not what people adore what cannot be thought with thought but however is the reason why thought thinks that is in truth the absolute and not what people adore what cannot be seen with the eyes and however is the reason why eyes see that is in truth the absolute and not what people adore what cannot be heard with the ear and however the ears hear because of it is that in truth is the absolute and not what people adore what cannot be breathed with the air of life but is the reason why life breathes that indeed is the absolute and not what people adore so mystagogy becoming christagogy takes us to the place itself of Christ, which is the union of what is divine, human and cosmic in a state of giving. And in that place that is Jesus, then and there, everything is open. And Jesus, Christ, gives us the hermeneutic key to discern to what extent the different initiatic ways of humanity take or lead to the same place where he is but if our path is not a path towards him but rather we are where he is he is where everything is where everything gets to so then he is in all the ways in all the avenues in all the paths and not just in any way of course not just anyhow but I, unfortunately i don't have time to specify that further I, I'm coming to an end, but I will by saying that the spiritual exercises end in a starting point. Where they end, they begin with a new existential way of being for everything. And then, and this is very important for the practice in which we are, the question to be posed is when we get to the contemplation and we achieve love, what do we do the years after that? What spiritual exercises do we continue to do? Well, there are four possibilities, in fact. One is the typical one, which is to repeat, yes, year in, year out, the same parkour, because it's not a repetition. Repetition is impossible, right? I mean, it's always different. It's like a liturgic cycle, so it's not repetition, not at all. We go along the same cycle at different depths according to the place where we are, but that is fully legitimate. And uh, well, we, we all benefit from this very positive practice. Another possibility is to identify at what point of the, of the path am I really? Am I, do I have to listen to my shadow? Do, can I dedicate eight days to go deeply into darkness towards my shadow? Am I at a point in which I can listen to my identity? Should I focus in this relationship with the identity issue? Or am I at a point in which I have to release, just drop everything and let divinity hide away, and let everything hide, not because we choose this, but it's what they call the darkest night, right? The darkest night of what we thought we knew, because that night will become when God and wants it in the kind, the kindest night, kinder than dawn, that uh, night in which loved and loving fused in one. So what is night becomes day. It depends on to what degree or extent do we attach to what we thought we knew. And then finally, the fourth option throughout the way, throughout the journey, words, and images and speeches have been given, give, receive, memory, freedom. And one prays more and more in silence. And then here you see the ways of silence, right? The way of silence that, that, that um, we will hear about next, yes. Oh, well, a number of silent practices, yes. And up to what point are the Ignatian when you are there in silence? It's part and parcel of the Ignatian tradition, but um, it's the prolongation really of the Ignatian prayer. I mean, these are things that we're going to be dealing with today. Thank you so much.
Muchas gracias, Javier, por esta presentación. Thank you so much, Javier, for this presentation. Thank you. Nothing to add, really. I know that there are questions because this has touched our hearts to all of us. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but maybe one or two questions. Please go ahead with the mic so that uh, the question can be interpreted, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier, for these presentations, which uh, I presume that uh, will be much more long in written form because you have not talked about the media or the result. I don't know whether you will talk about the result because I'm convinced that um, spiritual exercises are a mystagogy, not the mystagogy. And um, the other congregations, as you have said, and uh, talk about other mystagogies that may be very valid, but I don't know whether the final result, which is looked after with the mystagogies when the person comes back to the world is the same. I don't know other costumes, Cosmovisions, but I can understand that Protestants help uh, or, or, you know, use the exercises, but it's much harder for me to understand that uh, Eastern churches can use the exercises in the same way because the exercises somehow are born in the, let's say, Catholic vision. And it's easy to understand why the uh, theory of liberation is Catholic and, and not Eastern. So in that sense, I don't know, or I wonder, uh, what do you think or how do you feel about the result, the subject in the exercises is uh, someone apostolic, someone that wants to work with Christ and change the world. Do you think that this happens also with other mystagogies? Well, I was mentioning precisely like this, the, the way the Christagogy of the exercises makes that finally we have the unifying force that allows that uh, in at every moment, the divine, the human flow with and, and the cosmic part, the concretion of the world that needs to be transformed. And the retreatant becomes an altar Christ because he's offering and receiving, not only to achieve love, but to stay in love, remain in love. So uh, what you say is, is right and it's, it's true. I think that the uh, exercises are more, you know, Catholic from the Catholic tradition, but the, the personal transformation is to be for the transformation of the world. And that's the Ignatian part of uh, the mystagogy, precisely. There is a union with the divine, with God, through Christ, to pay that service to the world, to the transformation of the world. And so without no doubt, I think that's a specificity of the uh, Ignatian spiritual exercises. And it's true that maybe certain religious areas would be, you know, a little bit more renewed. Thank you. We're running out of time, really. So just one very last question before the break. And um, we know that we would like to stay listening to Javier for hours. Okay, well, two questions then. Two hands were risen, so two questions. Thank you, thank you, Javier. Um, it has been a wonder, really. Great. A question, maybe because I'm a psychoanalyst, Concerning the first shadow, which is not the luminous one. With uh, listening to you about the shower, uh, I would like to talk about the attachment theory, which is the basis of the relationship because the baby takes the breast and when we are 
in when we feel unsafe and secure we need the attachment and i do believe on the relationship between the retreatant and the director the accompanying person so the attachment is not a scene how to evolve from what you call the instinct of attachment to the freedom taking into account that the attachment is on the basis of everything that we do perfect i i see the problem is not the attachment but how we really uh, appropriate the the thing this can be a block a stumbling block and so it's important for the person not to be broken so the attachment needs to allow the other being to be okay very briefly now we have just some seconds for this very very last question this is a new area for me part of my responsibilities of looking at interreligious dialogue of which i know very little so thank you very much for your for your uh, uh talk I, i'm going to put two questions of which you only have time to answer one um one okay. one is a very traditional one um which i suspect you do have a very good answer for and that's the question of grace which is not the same as gnosis it seems to me that many of uh, many of the other religions have a profound gnosis um, that you've described very well but with Christianity, there's the action of grace, which is not the same as gnosis. However, that's the one you don't have to answer. The one, the one, the one that it really intrigues me is the um, throughout the whole of your your lecture, you talked about the dissolution of the I um, uh, and the loss of I, the loss of ego. It seems to me that in Christology, at the at the moment of the deepest kenosis on the cross. It's not a dissolution of the eye, it's the revelation of the eye of Christ. Um, and also in that moment, it's not the revelation of an absolute to which Christ surrenders himself, it's actually the revelation of the Father. So the absolute doesn't exist in that sense in Christianity. Um, and, and I just wondered how you, you, you come to terms with that when you're engaging with other religions. Good question. I think that we need another uh, symposium. Uh, and being you in Rome, you can organize and I willingly, I will be there. No, no, I, there are very important questions. Uh, there are the key questions, uh, the key questions in, in interreligious dialogue. Uh, so, of course, also for the mystagogy. Uh, so, thank you for the question. They are open questions and are there in the whole, in the, for the relator uh, to, to take it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Don, I, I, I think I cannot answer them. Uh, it's too, too big. Uh, Thank you. Okay, we know that we want to um, keep on talking, but we need a break now. So just have, let's take this um, break for 15 minutes and we see each other here in this time. Thank you.